Oh, and on a windy day, I held on the end of an umbrella, the wind blew, and I lifted off the ground. In that moment, with my feet on air, I was terrified. What if I flew far away from my behind refugee camp? The second stretch long. My fear could not come out of my mouth until the umbrella flew from my hands and I fell back to the earth. After that, I learned how to miss the ground as if it were a person whose lap I had taken for granted. I love the ground, I would say. Why I don't want it to know? Because it loves me. It doesn't love me. The girl didn't love though. She could not walk straight since her legs were not equal in strength. Everywhere she went, she lived her way there. Whenever there was a wall close to where she stood, she placed a small dirty hand on it for support. Mean children yell things at her. They called her a cripple. But she refused to stop running for them. She always wanted to play, even when kids were mean. She refused to tell our mother and father and told me not to tell them either. What could they do? Mother ran, our parents were both stuck in place. Every time they saw her struggling after the other cousins on some adventure, they looked down at their feet, helpless, but unwilling to stand still. They shuffled in place. I saw this and I knew that the ground did not love everyone. My older sister had polio when she was a baby. When we came to America, she was, uh, I was six, and she was seven and a half. And she knew that every color in America was yellow, and that every English word ended with an S. And I thought she was the smartest person ever. Because <laughs> at that first school, at Battle Creek Elementary School, the, the teacher said, say your ABCs, and I said, A, B, and C. And she said, say your ABCs again. And I said, A, B, and C, because it was all I knew. But God, she says to me, three years after we got to America, she won the Northern Elementary School spelling bee. Without, without understanding how many words she could take away, it's hard to put it back together again. Before we could afford the VCR, that was our human VCR. <laughs> we would go to the bookmobile that visited the McDonald Housing Project, and she would check out books, and we'd come back home. And she would open up the photos, and she would, she would say, pretend I'm a VCR, and I'm telling you a movie. The first time she went to the Guthrie Theater, she said, you know that, that the stories don't just happen in TV. They happen in life. I saw it. I saw it with my eyes. She said that life was like a ladder. If she was going to be the first here, then I would be the second. She said that if she was going to go to Hamlin University, then I would go somewhere better. And she read somewhere that there was a college called Carleton, and that it could be the Harvard of the Midwest. And she said, you have to go, you have to go. When I graduated from, from Carleton, she said, I'll stay at Hamlin so you can go somewhere better. And I told her I wanted to become a writer. And she said, you know, that's new for us. <laughs> and I said, but I want to become a writer. And she goes, then you have to go to the best program in writing in the nation. And the best nonfiction program is at Columbia University. It's an Ivy League. It's in a place in New York. It's in law and order, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and because of her, I went to Columbia University. All of our lives, she's always taken a step back so I could stand before her. She's an inch shorter than I am. She's an inch shorter than I am. But she became the lawyer that we needed to protect the rights that we never had enough of, so I could bench her into the arts. In the first few years right after Columbia, we opened up a writing agency in the most impoverished part of the city, in Brock Town, and nobody had money to pay for a young writer and a young attorney. So she took in all of these cases, and these people said, if you have a healing ceremony, you will come and do the dishes. The African-American woman says, I make great barbecue. Come to my house during the summers. And that was the gist of life. But I kept on trying to write this book, and Doug kept on saying, on the days that we had to count the pennies and the dimes. Once our credit cards had maxed, because we figured there was no better way to spend green money than to buy the dream. So we kept on using it to charge food. And on the day that it maxed and we couldn't find anywhere to go, she says, let's go to labor already. We'll stand in line and when people come to pick up workers, they can pick us up. And I said, 
let's go to Flood Bay, to the Flood Bay, because they give you 20, 25 dollars in a cookie. <laughs> and she says, if the thing you're going to be doing is going to show, is going to be on the blood of who we are, it better be great. And I said, I don't know what it takes to be great. And she said, I'll tell you what it takes to be great. You just have to believe in what is good of all human beings. You just have to trust them. You have to let your, your heart flutter on every single page. That's what it matters. That's what it takes to be great. And it is because of her that I'm standing here before you. It is because of my mother and my grandmother. It is because of all of my teachers 